Hi, I'm Brian Jones. I'm here with Gene Bonacorsi, our open car correspondent, and this is another edition of Hard Cap here in Sarasota. Day three, we have the quarters and the semis. Let's look first at the quarters. We had an exciting gate matchup with Chain Lightning versus Ironside, as well as uh, Revolver playing Machine, and then Ring of Fire playing Sockeye and Double Wide Goat. Tell us what you saw in the opening round today. Well, I was mostly watching the Ironside and Chain Lightning game. What we saw there was Chain again going for the Hux, playing the long ball like they like to do, and it was relatively unsuccessful. They were three for four, um, turning them over in the first first half. The only one they caught was a pretty incredible layout catch by Nick Lance, who's playing with a broken pinky. Um, apart from that, they were uh, having trouble connecting on the throws. Ironside went with their typical balanced, balanced offense, and they were able to get some breaks back uh, from Chain in the first half. In the second half, the teams pretty much traded upwind, downwind, but we saw a lot more fire from Ironside on D, and eventually they were able to break upwind for the win. The other game I watched uh, was Goat double wide. Goat had some trouble establishing their deep game as well as their uh, typical upline handler offense, and uh, double wide did a good job of stopping that with their zone. Yeah, as we saw that game, Goat went up 8-5 to five at half against Double Wide. And then Double Wide, as they said, uh, Kyle Van Auken talked about after the game that it was just a case of the drops, just an, an uncountable number of drops during the first part of that game against Goat that really led to that 8-5 deficit. Double Wide's able to come back and win that game. Also, in other action, we saw Revolvo completely destroy Machine, cruise to victory there, absolutely no problems whatsoever. And then the surprise of the entire round was Ring of Fire versus Sakai. Tell me, did you expect Ring of Fire to come out on top in this one? I actually did. After watching them in their uh, pre-quarter game against Johnny Bravo, I saw a Ring of Fire team that was bringing the energy, they're a really athletic, fast team, and they were using that to their advantage. Against Sakai, they really uh, came on defense aggressively, and Sakai's, uh, Sakai's handlers had trouble working their small ball offense. They were turning it over a lot, and Ring had a really high uh, percentage of, of, of turnovers that they turned into breaks. Yeah, Ring of Fire was able to be incredibly effective in that situation. Talked with some of the leadership afterwards. They talked about their defense, really forcing Sakai into taking shots downfield. Not only were they guarding the unders and forcing the receivers out, they were making sure to line up on the inside toward the middle of the field of the cutters, forcing Sakai to move laterally. Sakai wasn't willing to do that, and that's what we saw lead to the breaks and lead to Ring of Fire's eventual win and getting them into the semifinals, a team that was a sleeper pick for me after Chesapeake, not so much after Labor Day, but they definitely put together and it's a team with a lot of talent. So let's look forward then to the next round. We have the semis, we have Revolver versus Ring of Fire, and we have Ironside versus Double Wide, and the close one was Ironside versus Double Wide. Let's talk about that one. Yeah, the win played a huge factor in that game. What we saw was Ironside coming out with offensive lines that were kind of had a mix of defensive players and typical offensive players so that they could get the D uh, in the event that they turned it over. And it kind of worked, it kind of didn't, um, but what we saw was the team struggling to get upwind breaks. For Ironside, they had some trouble converting downwind in the first half, possibly due to those personnel changes, and uh, Double Wide exploited that and got some breaks. Towards the end of the half, though, Ironside really stepped it up, broke back to 7-7, and then 8-7 at half, in the second half, the only upwind break was uh, Double Wide's break to win at 14-12. I really think the key for Double Wide was staying away from the huck, working with Max Cook and uh, Kevin Richardson, the short throws that were very precise. They really excelled at that today, and I think that was the key to their success. Yeah, Max Cook had an absolutely incredible game. He, he scored the winning goal just on a miscommunication between Christian Foster and George Stubbs. And really, you got it for Ironside. you got to blame the, fat, the bad start, going down 6-2. They get to that 7-7 seven, seven point. They have the disc on the goal line with a chance of when to get it back on serve. At that point, you can kind of feel the momentum breaking in Boston's favor, and it just didn't work out. Double wide, able to hang on victory. you got to give a lot of credit to Kurt Gibson as well. He's a fantastic player. Tell me what you saw from him. Uh, Kurt really was the rock of their offense today, and um, in the times when they really needed to retain possession and keep Ironside from getting the momentum back, Kurt was the one making the throws. He had a couple of really nice upwind puts, and, uh, and he really stepped up for them, coming off of an injury and not playing with them a lot. I also want to correct myself, uh, Double Wide did not end up getting the break upwind to win. That was a downwind offensive point. Double Wide still gets the victory nonetheless, and we're going to move on to the other semifinal. We saw Revolver, a team likely to win, and they came out strong against Ring of Fire. Yeah, Revolver really didn't let the wind affect them. Uh, we saw Robbie Cahill and uh, Nick Schlag on offense just working the unders, uh, going from their spread offense, you know, Bo Kittredge and Ashlyn Joy in the cutting lanes. They're very fast, they're very experienced, and Ring, though they came out with, uh, 
with aggressive defense, as they did against Sockeye, they just uh, they were really weren't able to keep up. Uh, Ring of Fire, a great run to their season, but it, it's difficult to swallow for some of them. They're, you know, talking to the players, they're still upset afterwards. For them, they're going to look back in the season and say, "Hey, we made it to semis. We haven't done that in a very long time, and we we probably lost to the eventual re winner, as we'll see tomorrow." So let's let's talk about that game tomorrow. Does Double Wide have a fighting chance? I definitely think they do, and uh, I may not have said so before this weekend, but what I've seen out of them is they have a more complete roster than in the past, and not that their lower players were worse in the past, but they're willing to use their whole roster. We're seeing a very different O-line. Last year it was very Brody and Kurt based. They were basically playing catch out there, and this year I think they're a lot, uh, a lot more deep, and Jeff Loscorn, Max Cook playing really big roles and allowing them to work something besides the huck. I think that's going to be their best shot, is um, is making Revolver respect their under game and then coming with some defensive intensity. Yeah, Double Wide's had the advantage this year of using an offensive line that does not include Florida guys, with the exception being Cole Sullivan. Uh, they did throw an experimental line, not really an experimental, but they've been working on their four-man cup using Florida players Tim Garrett, Cole Sullivan, Chris Gibson, Kurt Gibson, and Brody Smith out there. Brody Smith saw limited action. Now let's talk about Revolver. We, we know the names, we've seen them before, but, but what, what makes them so good? Well, I think that the first thing that they have um, that they hold over other teams is Robbie Cahill as a field general. He's one of the best throwers in the game. He's experienced. He's unfazed by zones, man defense. And when the disc is in his hands, they're pretty much able to score no matter where they are on the field. As well, they have a number of experienced cutters. As I mentioned, Ashlyn Joy, uh, Bo Kittredge, guys who have played at Worlds, Nationals, repeatedly, you know, their cohesive line, um, which maybe some people didn't expect to see out of them coming into this tournament. I personally did. Um, and then on defense, they've added Bart Watson. Um, he can take control there. I think that really, though we talk about it ad nauseum, the personnel is uh, Revolver's strength. These are guys who have experience in big games. They've played in all kinds of weather. They've played against all kinds of defenses. They're confident in their abilities. Yeah, Revolver is always it's looking strong after a subpar regular season on their standards. Three losses, a big deal for Revolver. But they were surprised by the doubters. And I talked to Alexander Gesquire, their coach, after the game, and he said, I don't understand why people were doubting us, but it definitely lit a fi fire under us. So Revolver's back in the title game. This year they have a new opponent, no longer, no longer Ironside, double wide with the upset to get into the finals. Real quick, what's your score for tomorrow? I'm going to take... Revolver going 15-13 over double wide. It's going to be a great game. And there you have it. That's the scoop for tomorrow morning. Thanks. This has been another edition of Hardcap Day 3 in Sarasota. I'm Brian Jones with G. Bonacorsi, part of Sky Magazine's coverage of 2012 Club Championships.